um, um, it was going so fast and out of control that I couldn't manage it at all. And it, it did what uh, eventually happened to me on numerous occasions. It blew up. Um, so I had this little company that, uh, that, that blew up. And, and as uh, one of the characteristics of alcoholism is, at least in my alcoholism, is what, what I would do is I would lick my wounds, I'd crawl off to a cave somewhere, and I'd reinvent myself. And I'd come up with something grandiose, more elaborate and more spectacular to take your eye off of the failure that I just created or the mess that I just created. And I got into uh, motion picture uh, production. I uh, wrote and produced uh, a motion picture in the 70s that was to become a, a, a very big hit. And again, it's the Peter Principle. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm a creative guy that has fast, that fast start, that has a fast start and no finish. So I started this, uh, uh, I, this little venture and I produced this movie and it became a hit. It was called Car Wash in 1975. Um, so again, you know, I'm a victim of my own success. The Peter Principle set in very quickly after that one. When you, when you have a success in Hollywood, you're given the keys to the kingdom and, and don't give me the keys to the kingdom, please. So, so uh, what I was, you know, I was given the opportunity of making more films, and I quickly, my alcoholism just, just took off, and uh, uh, my consumption levels just went way up, way up. I just have no really, f no real foundation, and ha I shouldn't say don't. I don't. Uh, I do now. I didn't then. I had no sense of who I was myself. So I, I it was. I was just ego driven. I just ran with my ego. I just became more and more. Uh, a uh, figment of my own imagination, uh, this big shot that uh, was totally out of control, and once again, this film con film career totally blew up because of my own, because of my behavior, and and I ended up in the early '80s, a just pretty much a broken man. I had had all of the things that I thought would take to make me happy and make me successful. You know, I had her, I had the big house, I had all the money, I had all the stuff. You know, and I was miserable. I was just miserable. None of that stuff fixed it. None of that stuff made it okay to be me. You know, I had been living this big lie. And the only thing that I still had with me was this addiction to alcohol and drugs that, that, that I used to null the pain, dull the pain, and dull the reality of what I was becoming. You know, and finally, as, as the case of most alcoholics, uh, I couldn't lie to myself anymore. I couldn't look in the mirror. I couldn't tell myself any more stories, and I sought help. And I know my time is almost up, and I wanted to go into another direction, but the, what happened in my story was that I found help. I found help not of any of my own doing, just through what I believe was a spiritual awakening, a, a, a miracle in my life. I, I was led into a recovery program, um, which I have been into for till this day. My life today and, and, and the subsequent years of my recovery has just been remarkable. Um, I started back in the PR business, I started this little company. I was determined then not to let it grow into anything out of, you know, that I couldn't manage. And, and what I've learned is some humility and modesty and, and, and how to become right-sized in my life. Um, being a big shot nearly killed me. And what I've learned in my recovery is that that wasn't what I was intended. That wasn't what God intended for me to be. I'm not a big shot, and I'm much better off knowing that and not trying to be that anymore. Um, so I started this little PR company, and I, uh, a woman came to work for me. I, I moved to uh, Westport, Connecticut, um, got married, had, had two beautiful children, moved to Westport, Connecticut, started this little company, and, uh, and uh, um, this woman came to work for me who was a, um, a writer. And we started talking, or she started talking about me doing a book. I, I've had a, you know, I shared with you just a few of the, the stories, but I have lots of stories. And, and she kept saying, Gary, you got to write a book. You got to write a book. And I kept making all the excuses of why I couldn't write a book. You know, I have no education. I have no training. Uh, you know, my grammar is atrocious. I can't spell. You know, I gave her all these excuses, and she said, you know, Gary, they have this thing called grammar check, and they have this thing called spell check. She said, those aren't excuses. She said, but she said, you, there's one thing that you do need to be able to write a book, and that's the ability to tell a story. And she said, you can tell stories. So, you know, I thought she was right about that. And she said, you should write your book. So I uh, started thinking, you know, if I write my book, this my story, I'm going to get right back into the big shotism that nearly killed me. 
So what I thought I, I could do, though, was to tell the stories of people that I've worked with. Um, what I haven't shared with you is that most of the people that I worked with in uh, the course of my career were like me. They were alcoholics, they were drunks, they were uh, drug addicts. And many of them had found their way into recovery too. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be interesting to tell the, st the story of, these, of some of these people. So that's in, 19, in, in 2005 I began through the encouragement of this, this wonderful woman to start setting down some of these stories. Um, I've now written three books and almost done with my fourth um, and I've met some wonderful people. The, the, where I have, where my career has led me is to become um, uh, a uh, writer uh, a biog of collective biographies, uh, where I, I have a, um, my first book was called The Harder They Fall, and it's, it, it's the, the stories of celebrities who have found their way into recovery. Writers, uh, actors, musicians, lots of people that I worked with, sports stars, politicians, um, I wrote a second book uh, because the first one did reasonably well. My publisher said, would you be interested in doing a book on eating disorders? So I wrote a book called Feeding the Fame, which is about uh, prominent people um, who uh, have eating disorders. Eating disorders, by the way, in, in many respects is a greater shame attached to it than, than alcoholism. Um, and um, there were some remarkable people that I was able to interview and, and write about in that book. Uh, I did a third book, which is the one I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today, called Second Chances. One of the things about alcoholism is that it pretty much can take your career and put it down the drain and toilet, as was my case. But Second Chances is about prominent business people, um, nationally known business people, um, who had big time careers, who lost it as a result of uh, alcoholism and drug addiction and reclaimed their lives in recovery. And I'm very proud of this book. Um, um, it, uh, it meant a lot to me because that was my story too. I had you know, pretty much destroyed a career and thought it was all over when I got into recovery. And, uh, and I have f been fortunate to not only get a career back, but to also to meet many, many people who s had the same situation that I do. And the book that I'm working on right now, which I wanted to talk to you more about, but, but I'm not done. And, I, and I, there are stories that I still have yet to complete. I'm writing a book about women in recovery. Uh, that's another area of the recovery world that is not so well known, is that women suffer from alcoholism to the same extent, and if not greater, than, than men. Um, we don't tend to think of alcoholics as being women. You know, we're, most of the stories that we know about are, are men. But there are, are scores of women alcoholics who, um, because of the nature of the disease, remain secreted and in the closet about their alcoholism. And they suffer great shame. And what I've been able to do is to interview many, many wonderful women. Uh, I was able to, to include uh, Betty Ford, who just passed away. She's going to be in my book. And Ann Richards, the governor, the former governor of Texas. And, and many really wonderful, prominent women have shared their stories with me. So I hope to come back to you and, uh, at some point and talk about those stories. The book is called She's Come Undone. Um, but uh, I, there's one story I want to talk because I only know I, I know I have just limited time. But there's one story I want to tell you that I didn't share with you the last time I was here because I hadn't written this book yet. But in Second Chances, uh, one of the people that I'm most uh, most enjoyed talking to and most respect is a man named Michael Deaver. Um, I see some shaking your heads. Michael Deaver, for those of you who don't can't remember, I know you know the name, but Michael Deaver was President Reagan's uh, chief of staff. Deputy Chief of Staff, an absolutely wonderful man. He was with uh, President Reagan for 25 years. He accompanied him through his governorship of California through the White House. Michael Deaver was an alcoholic and um, has a, had a remarkable story. Michael Deaver passed away, oh, maybe three or four years ago now. But he was a remarkable man. And, and um, I'm going to share a little bit about his story as, just as evidence of what what alcohol does, alcoholism can do to people and what recovery can do. Michael Deaver resigned from the number two position in the White House, Deputy Chief of Staff. He resigned from that position after being with President Reagan for 25 years. And the reason for his resignation was he couldn't drink the way he wanted to drink in the White House. This was after 25 years. He said, you know, I was, I was on call to the President. 
And I got to the point where I resented him so much because I couldn't drink with impunity. He said, you know, Reagan could call me at any time he wanted. He could call me on a Sunday night. He could call me on a Monday morning. So I had to be, like, at least reasonably coherent. Um, he said, I took lots of chances when I drank, that, that, you know, that I would get out of it and Reagan would call me and I wouldn't be able to respond. But he said, you know, eventually, my alcoholism got to the point where I resented him so much because he, he inhibited my drinking that I thought this was it, I'm done. And he resigned. Now, it's hard to imagine somebody in that lofty position resigning because he can't drink the way he wants to drink, but that's the power of alcohol and the power that alcoholism had over this man's life. He said, also, I was very resentful that I didn't make any money. Everybody around me was making all kinds of money, and I didn't. He said, so I wanted to get even. And I resigned from the uh, from my... Uh, the uh, my office, and I started my own company. He started his own PR company, and uh, and he started to drink. And is the way you know the the way it happens with alcoholism is eventually he drank himself down the drain and and uh, found his way into recovery. And in 1989, three years after he had resigned, um, he was at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous out here in Los Angeles. And one of the tenets of, of uh, our program of, of in Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the 12 steps, is making amends. It's one of the things we do in, in, in our recovery is we make amends to people we have hurt and harmed in our life. And he said he was at a, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and they were uh, doing what they call a step study. And it just so happened that that step study that day was on the ninth step, which is the amends step. And he said he walked out of that meeting and it occurred to him that he had never made amends to the Reagans. You know, and he had, hadn't seen them in, in now three or four years and hadn't made amends to them. And he said, you know, I walked out of this meeting. He said, I'm, I'm in Los Angeles. He said, the Reagans live in Los Angeles. He said, I've got to call them. So he got in his car and he, and he picked up the phone and he called with no expectation that they would answer or they would be there. And Nancy Reagan answered the phone and he said, Nancy, this is, this is Michael. And she got very excited to hear from him. She hadn't spoken to him in several years. And, and he said, you know, I, I need to talk to you and, and the president. He said, is there any possibility I could make an appointment? And, and Nancy said, well, of course. She said, why don't you just come over? So he was kind of shocked at that and he, he, uh, he, he uh, drove over to their house in, uh, I think it was Bel Air, and he went and he said, I was very nervous. I hadn't seen him in years, and he said, and I had this, this uh, amends that I had to make, and he walked in, and he said they were so happy to see him, and they both embraced him, and they invited him into the den, and he sat down, and he said, listen, I, I have something very specific that I need to tell you, and I'll make it brief, and, and, and uh, that'll be it, and he said, you know, I, I, I'm an alcoholic, and, and one of the tenets of my recovery is that I need to make amends. And I'm here today to apologize for anything that I've done that has hurt you. I know I have written things about you that were unkind, that I've said things about you that were unkind. And I'm here today to apologize and to ask your forgiveness. And they looked at each other and then they looked at him and they said, you don't owe us any apology. They said, you know, we, we loved you. And we're so happy to learn that you're, that you're now not drinking and that you're in recovery and that you've found a solution to this. We're just overjoyed at that, and you don't owe us an apology. And he said, well, that's part of my program, and I do owe you this apology, and that's all I wanted to say. And I'm very thankful that you allowed me this opportunity, and now I want to go. And as he got up to walk out of the house, he said it occurred to him that today was Reagan's birthday. And he said, wow, he said, I, you know, he said, all of the years that I worked for, the, for Mr. Reagan, he said, I, every one of his birthdays, I would call first thing in the morning to wish him happy birthday. And he said, as he was walking out of the house, he turned around to, to President Reagan, he said, today's your birthday, isn't it? And Reagan smiled, and he said, yeah, it is. He said, I'm 80 today. And he said, oh, my God. He said, I didn't remember that when I asked to come here. He said, but I did when I were walking out. He said, happy birthday, Mr. President. And he said, now I have to tell you, he said, in all the years that I worked for him, he said, Reagan never touched me. He said he was a man who never liked physical contact. He didn't like shaking hands. He didn't like hugging people. He certainly wasn't Bill Clinton. He just didn't like making that contact. He said, and when I wished him happy birthday, he said he turned around and he gave me the biggest hug that I've ever had in my life. And he whispered in my ear, Michael, this is the greatest gift I've ever received. 